So good afternoon and welcome to the last session of today's Capacity Building Hub, which is on the thematic topic of networking. And this session has the title of what does it have to do with me, the role of coalitions to foster long-term climate action in cities. And that's exactly the question we will be discussing. How can we trigger more climate action and how can we make how can we make use of strong coalitions for doing so? In discussing this, I'm obviously not alone here, so I'm your moderator of this session. Uh, my name is Simone Sandholz. I'm with the United Nations University's Institute for Environment and Human Security in Bonn, Germany. And um, as you can see on the slide, there's five more speakers. You can see three of them on the panel, meaning we're still lacking one who's stuck between pavilions and here. I hope he's there in a minute. But um, we will start soon with a short opening statement by video from Marta Delgado. And then on stage, you see my colleagues, Flavia, Ariana, and Aditya. I'll introduce them as we go. So why cities? Um, so the se objective of this session is to really raise awareness around urban realities and on multiple urban realities, from the most vulnerable to the ones which might be able to cope with better. But we are all together in this climate crisis. And we all need to act on this because we share this joint demand of very urgent action as we've heard over the last days. However, this climate crisis really is hitting the most vulnerable the most because they have the least capacities to deal with it. And maybe our, also the question of capacity building and knowledge management is a very crucial one. So the number one thing we want to share in this one hour session is the question of knowledge, um, starting from perception. What do we actually know? How do we perceive it? So more from an individual and there um, we start soon. And then the second one is then how do we get from knowledge to action? So how do we build these coalitions? How do we actually build networks? And to get started, um, we will have a short introductory remark from a per video, as said, for Ms. Marta Degado Peralta. She's the Undersecretary for Multi Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights in the Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And besides that, she's also the head of the UN Habitat Assembly. So it would be very nice if we could have the video now, and I hope it's working. Muy distinguidas y distinguidos colegas y participantes en la Conferencia de las Naciones Unidas sobre el Cambio Climático, les quiero enviar un gran saludo como presidenta de la Asamblea de la ONU Habitat, de la Asamblea Mundial del Habitat, y como subsecretaria para Asuntos Multilaterales y Derechos Humanos del Gobierno de México. Estoy muy contenta de poder formar parte del cuarto hub de creación de capacidades y abrir esta sesión sobre el papel de las coaliciones eh, para fomentar la acción climática a largo plazo en las ciudades. Eh, esta está organizada por la Universidad de las Naciones Unidas a través del Instituto del Medio Ambiente y Seguridad Humana. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Me gustaría también agradecer a la iniciativa internacional eh, sobre el clima del Ministerio Federal de Economía y Acción Climática de Alemania a través del proyecto Coaliciones Urbanas Transformadoras por la invitación para in intervenir en este importante evento. También quisiera felicitar al Comité de París para el desarrollo de capacidades, a sus copresidentes, John Shan Shan, eh, Roberta y Ana, por destacar el Capacity Build Hub este año y por subrayar el importante papel de las coaliciones y las redes para lograr un futuro urbano más sostenible. La ciencia es muy clara, según el Grupo Intergubernamental de Expertos sobre Cambio Climático, el IPCC, en todas las ciudades y las zonas urbanas ha estado aumentando el riesgo que corren las personas y los bienes por los peligros que están asociados al cambio climático. Al mismo tiempo, las ciudades son un factor clave que contribuye al cambio climático. Las actividades que se van a cabo a nivel local son, eh, por un lado, las principales fuentes de emisión de gases de efecto invernadero y también las soluciones están ahí. 
Este dilema se soluciona solo con un enfoque y una acción colectiva coordinada también a nivel regional, eh, nacional e internacional. Esto significa que las redes y las coaliciones son muy importantes para poder tener un impacto real. Este proyecto de coaliciones urbanas transformadoras que dirige la Universidad de las Naciones Unidas y el Instituto de Recursos Mundiales es un ejemplo de ello. Facilita el establecimiento de coaliciones transformadoras en cinco ciudades latinoamericanas, incluidas dos ciudades de México. El municipio de Naucalpan, uno de los municipios más grandes de la zona metropolitana de, entre el Estado de México y la Ciudad de México, y el municipio de León en el Estado de Guanajuato. Este proyecto tiene como objetivo reunir a diferentes actores y redes para lograr nuevas estrategias y con esto enfrentar los desafíos urbanos locales, al mismo tiempo en que se puede reducir la desigualdad y las emisiones de carbono. También tiene un importante componente de capacitación, de intercambio de experiencias y de conocimientos y por eso estamos el día de hoy aquí. El Gobierno de México está comprometido con el empoderamiento de las ciudades, su internacionalización, la interconexión de las comunidades, sus poblaciones, los diferentes actores, de acuerdo con sus necesidades y sus intereses. Nuestro proyecto Interconectando Ciudades inteligentes, por ejemplo, reúne temas que son claves para crear futuros urbanos sostenibles, generar prosperidad absoluta, crear ciudades en donde todas y todos podamos ser contribuyentes de la mejoría del entorno y generar ecosistemas participativos donde se fomente la educación y la salud, que son pilares para un impacto global eh, significativo. El liderazgo urbano es muy importante para lograr cero emisiones de carbono y la cooperación es la forma más eficiente para ampliar los conocimientos, para desarrollar la creatividad, apoyar la creación de ciudades inteligentes, inclusivas y sostenibles para todas y todos. Les deseo muy buenos resultados en las actividades que están desarrollando. Estaré pendiente de estos hallazgos, de la participación. A todas y todos les aprecio mucho su atención. Thank you so much for playing the video. So that was remarkable introduction, giving a broader perspective on the need to act on cities, which house more than half of the global population, as we all know, but which are also not only the biggest emitters, but also facing the severe impacts of climate change. So that is why we need to act on cities, but we can't do this alone. We need networks for doing so, and they should not only act on climate change, but also on other crucial urban issues, because we need to think on this in a very interlinked way for instance, on the aspects of social justice as climate change, as I mentioned, impacts the most vulnerable the most. So how do we get to this? And how do we first capture demands, capture impressions, and capture these urban realities? And there I want to hand over to my dear colleague, um, Ms. Ariana Flores Corral, who is a fellow Mexican with Ms. Delgado. And uh, she's, she's a communications analyst with the United Nations University and, among others, responsible for outreach and transformative communication in the project that was just mentioned by Marta Delgado on transformative urban coalitions. So, Ariana, the word is yours. Thank you. Well, what does a desirable city look for you? So, if you think a little bit, like, you close your eyes and you start thinking, what is m my city, the city of my dreams? I would think maybe green, it has good transportation, um, there are many places where you can be with your family, with your friends, with your neighbors, with your community. You have parks where kids are playing, uh, places where people can dance, people can be together, and it's safe for women to walk. You can walk at night and you won't be scared. So that's what I think is a desirable city. But this looks different for every one of us. 
Um, so now I can invite you just to turn to my right side. You'll see there's a photo exhibition there. And if you take a look at those photos, you will see how a desirable city looks for people around the world. So just maybe later you can take a closer look because probably you're a bit far from now. Um, and I would also like to invite you to, to watch this uh, short video. Uh, my vision of a desirable city will be a city that is inclusive, a city where to be poor is not a crime, a city where there is no discrimination, and a city where forced eviction is a thing of the past. As human, we all should have the bare minimum needs to be met. And also, I imagine the future cities will be more reliant on renewable energy shifting from fossil fuels. Uh, so that we can cut the emissions of gases like CO2 and reduce and deaccelerate the impacts of climate change. A place which is safe, inclusive and accessible for everyone. Overall, a safe space for all types of diversified people regardless of age, race, class and gender. For a sustainable future, I think the best way is to convert these cities into a bicycle friendly or pedestrian friendly infrastructure Una ciudad deseable es una ciudad de oportunidades. Oportunidades que están distribuidas de forma equitativa y en justicia a lo largo y ancho del territorio urbano. Saber, ouvir, dialogar, entender a nossa história para só assim poder transformar social e ecologicamente uma cidade de oportunidade e transformada para todos. Thank you. So, if you take a look at those photos again, these are the photographers who portrayed their vision of a desirable city in those beautiful pictures. So, what you heard in the video is actually what you would see there. And, 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 and this is important because it shows how visual representation, photography, and films can actually speak more in a way than one, what you will have heard or you will have read in a thousand words. So this event is more about the role of coalitions to foster long-term climate action in cities. And it's based on the Transformative Urban Coalitions Project. And I have really good colleagues here that would explain you more in detail what is this project about, and I'm sure they know way better than me. But I can tell you more about these selling points that would make, in my opinion, this project a bit different. And it's more about the transformative communication. So long-term climate action and increasing climate ambition will only happen if we inspire people. And to inspire people, we need to touch their hearts, we need to reach their emotions, and only then there will be that final step to ask for climate action. That is what everyone actually needs. And these photographies, art, movies, tell stories of the people from those cities. Tell, tell a story from a people that is living there every day, watching a video, watching these photos, it makes you feel related to them. It makes you feel like you're there. It transports you to the city in Teresina that is there, Calcutta. It tran transports you there in that moment, in that precise moment where the photographer was taking a picture, you're there with him or her. So you can understand the challenges they face but you can also feel related to their hopes and dreams, and you can des decide that you would like to live in a sustainable city like them. So for me, this project, this sellout point is that it's not only about the data, it's not only about the research, it's not only 
about the implementation. It's also about the communication. And it's also about how we will make people relate between each other to form these coalitions, to form these networks. So we work together, we act for climate, we reduce emissions, and we create zero carbon cities for all. So I hope with this I planted the seed for you to get more interested on the project, and I think Simone can introduce you more to our other panelists that can speak better about this project than me. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ariana. Hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, so Ariana spoke about the different perceptions of people, and she showed us this impressive video, and you can see the photos around how people think a desirable city should look like. So we all have these ideas, these visions, we strive for something. But now, how do we, how do we actually achieve it? That is the key point, right? We all n probably know what we want, what we're not yet having clear is the way to get there. And uh, she already touched upon this transformative urban coalitions project, which is exactly analyzing that. So there, we want to know how do we get from there to actual action by means of networks, by means of coalitions. But we also need to start from what is people's mindsets and how can we actually speak to different types of people, which is exactly the perfect segue to Flavia Gerha, who is a senior researcher with UNU and who would introduce us in um, ways of supporting climate action and coalition building by research and capacity building in the project that Ariana mentioned. Floor is yours. Thank you, Simone. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, I don't have any videos or pictures, but I still want to transport you somewhere. So I have some slides as a good researcher, if you could put that on. We can, we can immediately go to the next one, please. Um, so I think there was quite a good introduction already to the project. Um, maybe I can tell you about the different components. So you heard a little bit about the communication, a bit about our arts and film component. Uh, Lucas, can you please, uh, the next slide? Uh, and here I'm hoping that this is as interesting and as cool uh, of a component. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our research, which is very interlinked. Uh, with um, everything that was said before, but also with the, um, the capacity development side of the project as well. So UNU is leading both of these components, the transformative research and the capacity development associated with, with TUC. Um, so we do different types of research within the context of the project with, for, and uh, about our urban labs. And you'll see that today you'll hear more about the research we do about and for the urban labs. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Many of you are probably wondering what are urban labs? It's always the first question that we get when we talk about our project. Um, so basically they are spaces where different actors convene to form these, what we call the new actor coalitions. And here we're talking about actors from the community, um, from academia, from NGOs, from policymakers, the private sector. The goal is really to facilitate these um, coming together of different people with a focus particularly on vulnerable groups and people who are actually most often not included in decision-making processes in the city related to climate. Uh, so. In the context of the project, this has looked like um, meetings, monthly meetings, workshops with these different members of, um, of uh, the city, different actors uh, who come together and really try to map the problems that they face, the, the most pressing problems in their city. They try to dialogue and reach a consensus regarding what a vision for a more sustainable city for them would, would look like try to get on the same page, build the vision for their city and also an action plan to go along with it. And here is what you see in the slide. So we have the coalition and then they build the vision, the action plan, and they start implementing what we call the initiatives or interventions, um, which will amount to a catalyst project for transformation that, like my colleague was saying, that fulfills all of these 
interlinked goals of uh, decarbonizing uh, urban development and also uh, tackling existing uh, social inequalities. So far, so we started uh, setting up these urban labs uh, with the, the local partners that we have this year. Uh, so far we have around 100 hours of workshops in the books um, and we've also been doing research about these people. So um, we did a baseline uh, data collection period starting in December 2021 and it went up until August 2022 um, with the urban lab members, so the actors that are participating actively in these meetings. We also went into the field, we did a lot, a lot of um, fieldwork interviews to really try to understand First of all, what are their mindsets about climate change? What do they think? How do they relate to it? How do they see it in their own contexts? Also, what is their capacity for climate action? And then we have a third project indicator that deals with um, the organizations, the way that these uh, people and their organizations work together already or not, and whether this is changing throughout the project. So we ended up with uh, over 150 uh, respondents to, to our survey. And I would like to share some of the results with you um, today. So uh, in general, we see that people understand climate change as a problem in their city. Uh, you see 98% of the respondents to our survey, they do see it's a problem. Uh, a slightly less per uh, lower percentage thinks they are as important as other urban issues. And here I highlight that we're working in Latin American cities. So uh, a lot of these urban issues relate to poverty, inequality, access to basic services such as sanitation and potable water um, and, and other problems. So they do see, see climate change as a problem, kind of, maybe not as important uh, as other urban issues. Uh, and when we ask them directly to rate the top three most pressing problems in their city, they don't mention climate change at all. So here we were saying, okay, is this social desirability in the answers for the first questions, or is the link between climate change and urban development in their own context and social justice issues not actually very well understood by these, um, by these actors? And so we found uh, that there were also different ways of um, addressing climate change. So people had different ideas of what our approach to climate action should be. And these, we call them the entry points for mindset shifts. And I would like to show you... Um, we are trying to find uh, trends and tendencies within our results and we came up with three personas that are represented in the, the results of the mindsets research. Um, there's the orange persona, we're still working on their names. Right now I'm calling it the, the bystander with mixed feelings uh, because this is a person that usually has mixed worldviews on how we should address climate change. Um, we have communitarian people who think that we should mostly focus on bottom-up climate action. We have people that are more hierarchical and think we should rely more on top-down governance of climate issues. The fatalist one thinks we shouldn't do anything at all. It's not really worth to do anything. We're all doomed. And then we have the individualist, which is like looking out for number one mostly. Um, this person, the orange persona, has a dissatisfaction with government-led climate action and processes. There are some climate denial tendencies, I think. Although we see that people acknowledge climate change as a problem in general, this is the cluster or the persona where we find um, the most trends of climate uh, tendencies. So 20% of the people think that maybe climate change is exaggerated. Uh, and it, this person ranks the lowest among the climate action indicators. So when they, uh, we ask them to see oh, what types of climate action or behaviors are you pursuing, um, they, had, they rated the lowest, so they were pursuing less than the other clusters. And they mostly have technocratic views about, oh, well, technology will address um, most of the problems of climate change. So, um, and here we see that this persona is particularly uh, found with among the private sector. But it's also present uh, when we see, when we look at other types of organizations. Uh, they are all spread across all of our five cities, but we see um, Teresina and Recife, so our Brazilian cities, or in this case the urban labs in these cities, having a larger representation of these orange personas. 
So very quickly on the, the blue persona and green persona. So the blue persona, I'm calling it the, um, the detached optimist. We see a lot of representation of government agencies within this uh, blue persona. It's actually the only cluster that has a favorable, favorable opinion about what government, municipal government is doing in terms of climate efforts, which <laughs> makes sense. Uh, but they see climate change, well, some of them see climate change as maybe a more distant threat that affects other people, other generations more than themselves, and it should be resolved mostly by global north, country, uh, global north countries because they had the biggest role in, uh, um, in causing it. Again, we see more technocratic views as well, and it's the only persona that rates uh, economic barriers higher than political barriers. Um, then finally, the green persona, I'm calling it the um, skeptical uh, activist uh, because you see it, it rates higher in terms of climate action. There's more communitarian worldviews, believing in bottom-up climate action, which is very much resistant towards uh, more top-down uh, climate action, very dissatisfied with government-led decisions and processes. Uh, but also very skeptical that we will be able to fulfill urban development and decarbonization goals um, uh, concurrently at the same time. So next slide, please. Uh, just some findings uh, that relate this to the capacity development and uh, knowledge gaps. So we see that on average 30% of the respondents to our survey identify um, that their knowledge might not be uh, sufficient to deal with the climate crisis. The scientific and technical knowledge ranks among the top three of most needed resources to stimulate climate action across our five cities. And so we see that these could be entry points for capacity development um, and also mindset shifts. Next one. And here we're really just, I'm going to give you some examples of uh, some capacity development activities, very briefly, that we are already uh, pursuing within the TUC project to answer to these needs and gaps in terms of capacity development, but also mindset shifts. Uh, we have, are dealing with very traditional type of capacity development, let's call it that, in, uh, in a sense that we are giving lecture style sessions in the urban labs because I told you there is this very collaborative nature in the project. You have researchers working with government but also with private sector and local communities. So really trying to, to pass this mes message and give them inspire examples from other cities that are coupling these different supposedly different agendas of urban development, social justice and climate action. Uh, we are also pursuing some uh, gamification of these issues because we really want to appeal for different types of, of actors, including uh, young people in Brazil, uh, very hands-on initiatives where they get to associate climate action to initiatives or interventions that answer their needs, their everyday needs uh, very much more directly. Uh, we're also pursuing um, developing some modules on nature-based solutions to try and the intersection of nature-based solutions and social justice to try to get people to uh, think less of technology as the silver bullet and answer to climate change, but really trying to weave in traditional knowledge, creating ownership within the community to if we do um, build green infrastructure projects that are connected that they create ownership and they feel like it's their project and then they take care of it. Uh, so these are just some examples. Next slide, please. And this is my final one. I wanted to leave you with uh, some pictures, <laughs> which maybe appeal to you more than all of this, um, the, the data from the research, uh, where it, it really illustrates some of these activities that we have going on that merges the traditional knowledge development, capacity development activities that we are developing, but also other ones that take us out of our comfort zone. Um, Simone and I, we've just come back uh, from Mexico where we uh, had a capacity development activity where we promoted a competition for German candy. And uh, this was very well received. And <laughs> so, yeah, just some words of inspiration, hopefully, for all of you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Flavia. So with this beautiful last slide that you hopefully still remember, 
that's, I think, the perfect segue to the next presentation. So we've now heard about perception, we've heard about mindsets and potential entry points and ideas and for strategies for capacity development, but it's not that the, that we or that every one of us doesn't have any knowledge about climate change, that there is this wealth of knowledge, there's a lot of potentials. The question is, how do we actually then build these coalitions? How do we share these capacities? And the perfect person to answer this question is Aditya Bahadur. He's a principal researcher with the human, on human settlements with the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. And they are with a tr long track record. I think you're the perfect person to now guide us on, on really how to build strong coalitions to share capacities and build also build joint narratives for climate action and sustainability transformation. Please. Great. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And I've been listening to the earlier presentations uh, with great interest and rising stress because I don't have pictures nor do I have videos, but what I do have is interesting concepts. Um, <laughs> but um, before we begin, I just want to step back for a second. This really remarkable project is running across three countries. It has um, organizations involved in it from you know, six different places, and it's really talking about a global problem. Um, the challenge that we as um, members of this project were faced with is how do we get all these disparate actors to speak to each other, to engage with each other, to engage other relevant actors beyond those who are directly involved in the project so that we start to imp amplify the impact of what's happening in each of the individual five um, urban labs uh, so that it delivers a much broader impact. Um, and the answer to that was twofold. One was figuring out the structure of how we're gonna structure these communities that are going to ex talk to each other and engage with each other. And the second challenge was content. How do we get them to speak to each other about something and in a language that resonates? So um, that's what I'll talk about over the next three or four minutes. If I could have the next slide, please. So the idea here is that um, to amplify what this transformative urban coalitions initiative is doing is to build a global community of transformation. This will be a platform for learning and exchange across the different urban labs and involving all the different consortium members dotted around the globe. The objectives of this are fairly clear. We want to understand how transformation is taking place within this project whose central goal is to deliver transformative change. And this entails thinking through the concept of transformation and the stratagems and the strategies that have been employed by the different urban labs to work towards transformation. We want people from the different cities to talk to each other about the activities they engaged with, the approaches that they're deploying, the methods that they've adopted, and the operational aspects of how they're developing these transformative shifts uh, at the urban scale. And crucially, we want this to have a forward planning uh, strategic orientation where we're thinking about next steps as opposed to only navel gazing about what's happening there in the moment. So on the next slide, the way we've conceptualized this is really as nested concentric circles where at the core of it are people like us sitting on the stage and some of the people sitting at the back of the room, the core team that is involved in the day-to-day -day operations of this very remarkable project. But then we have one layer out, which is an immediate set of stakeholders who we are engaging with. This will be journalists, people in government, policy makers, researchers, um, students, concerned citizens, activists, and uh, you know, our donors, who are also in the immediate one layer out um, group of stakeholders who we are engaging with. And we want to involve them in the conversation as well. And then we have a third tier which is a more passive tier of people who will be receiving information on how to do pro-poor decarbonization, how to transform uh, cities so that they become places where we all want to live. Um, and of course, there is movement of stakeholders between these three criteria. So this is, by and large, the structure of how we want to pull together these communities of transformation across this global initiative. Now on the next slide, we'll see 
what we're talking about here. So we were faced with a range of issues that we could, uh, you know, we could form the core of the content on what people will talk about. But of course, naturally, given that transformation is in the very title of the project that we are trying to uh, deliver here, we felt it, it is most useful to make sure that transformation lies at the very core of what people are talking about. The challenge with this idea of transformation is that it's been explored in extremely different ways by different people. The social protection people talk about transformation in a particular way. The education people talk about transformation in a particular way. Psychologists talk about transformation in a particular way. The livelihoods people talk about transformation in a way. And let's not even go to the engineering um, uh, information technology disciplines who have uh, their own take on what transformation is. So what we did here was we basically reviewed uh, the core strains of literature on transformation and determined that there are a few key characteristics and a few key pathways um, to deliver transformative change in the way that we were talking about it. And we want this to be the common framework that links all these different actors across geographies and across the concentric circles that we talked about a minute ago. And some of these characteristics are intuitive and some of them are probably less intuitive. Let me go through them very quickly because I've been given a strict um, five minute window which I will stick to. Um, the first is inclusion and empowerment. A uh, core to the idea of transform transformative change is that people who are at the heart of the change that we're trying to achieve feel like they have the agency to influence processes of change around them. The second is around taking a systemic approach as opposed to working in sectoral silos where people developing roads are not talking to people developing drains, who are not talking to people developing houses, who are not talking to people developing um, you know, other water and sanitation systems. We want to ensure that transformative change is about working at the confluence of sectors rather than in individual sectoral silos. So we want the communities of working across these different geographies to talk about how this might be happening. The third is about tackling the root causes of risk and vulnerability. We now have at least three decades of hard evidence that demonstrates its issues of caste, class, gender, accountability, transparency, and agency that underpin people's vulnerability to um, different kinds of risks, including that from climate change. Unless you're tackling these root causes of vulnerability, you're only playing the, playing the short, uh, short game and delivering, tackling proximate causes as opposed to getting to the heart of the problem. And so we want people across these different geographies talking about how they might be tackling some of these root causes of vulnerability. And I think in the very structure of the urban labs is the idea of agency uh, where the common citizen is going to have a voice in determining how the city transforms in the face of different kinds of shocks and stresses and deliver low carbon climate resilient pathways. The fourth is changes at scale. We are arguing that to deliver transformative change, you can't just talk about a few houses doing a particular kind of experiment with a novel technology, for instance. We need to talk about changes at scale. Now, we're not objectively defining what scale is, but we mean it could be a large proportion of the population that you're tackling, or it could be um, you know, a large concentration of institutions or individuals that you're engaging with. So we want to people across these different communities of practice, across the different urban labs, to talk about how they're delivering changes at scale. The penultimate characteristic is about catalytic and impact. You cannot just have a flash in the pan and claim that you're transforming something. You need to demonstrate what you're doing in a particular context is reverberating and having an amplified impact. So what you might be doing in an urban lab directly might be influencing people in a different city to do something. And those are the kinds of changes that we want people to talk to each other about, relate, and communicate to each other. And the final characteristic is about sustainability. You can't claim that you're delivering transformative shifts by doing something that is going to expire once project funding finishes. So these are actually about tackling the institutional shifts that might be happening um, at the local level through urban labs or the other initiatives that we're delivering. Um, and finally, we argue that you could embody these characteristics through work in, in different sectoral silos and pathways. You could talk about behavior change, you could talk about innovation, or you could talk about policy shifts. Whereas in reality, we know what community is actually going to talk about is work that cuts across these different pathways. 
So that's a very quick immersion into an emerging consensus on what transformation looks like and what we hope uh, the community of transformation will be talking uh, about across this remarkable project that is spread across geographies, across thematic areas, and across institutions spread in different parts of the world. Simone, back to you. Thanks so much, Aditya. So, as you already said, across countries, so it's, it's probably even broader. And you showed this very impressive slide with the different actors, and it's just so many. But without liaising, without collaborating, we cannot achieve as much as we could do together. So I think that's summing it up perfectly. And that probably is, not only probably, that is something more universal, which is going beyond the scope of the project that we presented to you in a few presentations right now. But now, let's zoom out a little bit. And I couldn't imagine a better speaker for doing so than Michael Daus, who's the Director of Urban Efficiency and Climate for the World Resources Institute's Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. So, Michael, having listened to all of that, so what, what do you see in terms of what's the need for climate action? And, how do we deal with these different urban realities and then these multiple actors in the urban sphere? Great, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, cities lie very much at the heart of both the causes and the consequences of climate change. Um, they're responsible for 70% of greenhouse gas emissions, looking at both direct and indirect emissions, and they're very often in vulnerable locations uh, exposed to the impacts of climate change and with high population densities. Um, but they also have agency, and we've discussed agency amongst the community, um, but they also have agency through their roles as leaders, conveners, uh, and by taking direct action. Um, and they're committing to ambitious climate action. We're seeing over a thousand cities last year at COP26 committed uh, to science, adopting science-based targets on their mitigation. Um, but the challenge is how do you change, how do you, how do you translate that commitment into action on the ground? Um, and that's where we're seeing cities really struggle uh, and where initiatives such as these are so important. Um, I'd like to just talk a bit more about what we see as three essential ingredients in moving from pledges to action. And the first is to make it about people, uh, make climate change about people. Um, cities need to balance a wide range of competing interests and priorities, uh, from housing to economic growth to public health. And they often rank above climate change in the concerns of most people and politicians, as we just saw, uh, looking at those different uh, personas. And so traditional mitigation and adaptation entry points are often insufficient uh, in persuading uh, policymakers to take action at both the scale and pace that is necessary uh, for the Paris goals. And to succeed and provide new motivations to act, we need to seek out synergies between mitigation and adaptation goals and other local priorities such as clean water, sewerage, housing, and access to services. Um, and luckily, these synergies aren't hard to find. Uh, they're kind of everywhere. And through our research, we know that closing the urban services divide uh, and reducing inequalities in access uh, to clean water, to power, to transport, to jobs, can be one of the most powerful levers and most powerful entry points to advance ambitious climate action. Again, linking back to the project, engaging people and making it about people is very important. Number two, get ready for implementation. Pledges are important, but they don't deliver action on the ground. And incremental mitigation and adaptation actions advanced in silos are insufficient to get us to the Paris goals. We need a whole system approach that unlocks collaboration across sectors, across organizational boundaries, and embeds climate goals in all key decision-making fora, uh, including land use planning, budgetary planning, but also critically, community engagement. And number three, get the right people together. Um, cities don't operate in isolation, local authorities don't operate in isolation, and many levers to accelerate climate action um, lie beyond the city's direct authority and beyond their boundaries. For example, national governments uh, often have control over building codes, power supply and vehicle standards, whilst regional planning often has a big impact on commuting patterns uh, and emissions from commercial and industrial activities. And similarly, individual behaviour